Well, hello and welcome to another edition of the Llama Commerce Show. I am your host, Brett Curry, lead strategist here at Classy Llama. And our podcast slash video show exists to demystify e-commerce into actionable bites. Today, we are talking about a topic that should be near and dear to every online merchant's heart. And this is one of those topics that can definitely move the needle make a huge difference in your business. And so as we look at our agency, clients that we build sites for or run SEO or paid search campaigns for, the majority are, are selling through marketplaces and, and are multi-channel. Some are in the process of becoming multi-channel and getting on marketplaces. But everybody's thinking about it. Everybody's considering it. How do we maximize it? How do we make the most of marketplaces? And so we brought on an expert. This guy lives, eats, breathes, sleeps, marketplaces. He has other hobbies too. I don't want to mislead you on that. But uh, really excited to have the co-founder of Cellbright, Mr. Mike Eugenio, on the show today. So Mike, welcome to the show. How's it going? Thank you, Brett. Um, that really is my only hobby, uh, multi-channel selling. Uh, <laughs> is that true? You. That is. So no, no surfing, no, no, no. no. That's all we do here. Um, Thank you, uh, Llama Commerce uh, viewers and listeners. It's, I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Um, and uh, yeah, excited to uh, talk with you a little bit about multi-channel. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. And, and I will confess, I don't have all that many hobbies either. I've, I've got a big family, so I, I'm taking care of kids and thinking about e-commerce or search marketing. And that, that's what I do. And so, you know, hey, th there could be worse things for sure. Yeah, so absolutely. Maybe we need hobbies, maybe not. Maybe listeners could advise us on hobbies. If they have some recommendations, we, we may uh, have to consider that. But uh, we're talking about how to maximize multi-channel and maximize marketplaces. So before we do that, I think it's always fascinating for people to get a little bit of the background. So you got this awesome piece of software that we'll dive into and we'll talk about tips and specifics on how to get the most from different marketplaces. But before we do that, what's your background? Like what, 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 what led you to get into this business? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I got started in e-commerce in 2008. Um, actually, a really, really cool opportunity. Uh, I started working for an online retailer um, that was in the home improvement space, selling power tools and big appliances and industrial stuff like that. Um, and uh, they had a really interesting business model. Um, they would partner with manufacturers to build them their own website, kind of like an outlet store that was just dedicated to that manufacturer. Uh, and in doing so, would sell a full line of, of inventory, um, all of the, the new product that that manufacturer had, um, as well as uh, any returned, discontinued, excess or obsolete and refurbished product, which is really pretty interesting. So from, from that experience, first of all, I learned that like refurbished inventory, distressed inventory, can be um, uh, made exclusive. So as a retailer, if you can get access to that inventory and no other retailer can, you can have a competitive advantage there. So I learned a lot about um, how to try to negotiate or identify those types of opportunities uh, to get that competitive advantage. Um, but also- and There's a big demand for that type of merchandise as well, right? There's a lot of huge. people looking for refurbished Merchandise, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, huge. And, and at the time, it was still relatively undis unknown or undiscovered. Um, and home improvement uh, or manufacturers, rather, in particular, had millions of dollars of inventory that had been returned from the likes of Home Depot or Costco, um, a lot of which maybe had never been opened. Um, mm. But they didn't really know what to do with it. Retailers didn't really know to ask for it. So there was just this pile of gold sitting there that you know this particular company was really able to identify, which was uh, pretty cool. Um, yeah, fascinating. Yeah, and then on top of that, uh, because we were working directly with a manufacturer and building them a, a website devoted to them, we got to create a lot of different content for that uh, brand. Um, and it was kind of the beginnings of what we know today as content marketing, but we didn't really realize that. We just looked at it as interesting programming or things to put on our website that could that people would click on um, that would make the website more interesting. Uh, so um, learned a lot there. Um, and uh, as that business grew, so when I started, they were doing about $25 million a year. Um, and by the time I left, we were doing about $80 million a year. Um, wow. And we're a top 30 Amazon and eBay seller. 
um, selling around the world. Um, and as, as that business grew, I noticed uh, as a buyer that more and more of my business was transitioning to these marketplaces, or rather that business was picking up and comping against my same store sales on my website was more and more difficult, particularly if I was trying to drive traffic through Google. Um, so I had to get more creative with my programming, um, leverage these other sales channels, come up with different types of distribution strategies. Um, and uh, that's where I um, became more familiar with what my future partner in Cellbrite uh, was doing. Uh, my partner's name is Brian, who was actually managing the marketplace expansion side of, uh, of that business. So we met, yeah, so we met working for that, that company. The company is called CPO. Um, and uh, he was responsible for moving us onto the marketplaces and dealing with all the technical challenges and merchandising challenges that came with that. Um, and so, you know, realizing that there was a bigger need to sell on those marketplaces, coupled with how hard it was to actually do, uh, led us to branch off and start Cellbrite. Interesting. So I want to, I want to unpack just a couple of quick things in that in yeah. that story, and then we'll dive into specifics and where marketplaces are today, and and how Cellbrite fits into that mix. So you guys are doing you guys are doing content marketing before it was trendy and before it was cool and before you know you, that, that had some swagger behind that that title. Yeah, before it was it cool. Like, you know, yeah. 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 Yeah, and no, so no, no. it was before, also before it was actually before we knew how to measure it too. So, you know, I don't want to make it sound like we were really ahead of the curve. We kind of stumbled into you know into, uh, into it. Yeah, right on. And so then, as you guys were growing, and, and that's impressive growth from twenty five million to over eighty million. Mm -hmm. What what percentage of that growth? And and I know this was in the past, and so maybe fuzzy, but this would just be interesting. How much of the growth was fueled by marketplaces versus, you know? site sales, you know, the, the, the core e-commerce site sales that they could have been driven by SEO or paid search or, or other channels. Sure. A lot of it was, um, okay. when I, when I got started, we were really just getting started. We were selling a little bit on Amazon. Um, but, uh, we were selling on eBay. In fact, the business originally started on eBay. Um, and, uh, I'd say it was about 10% of overall sales. And by the time I left, it was, it was closer to 40% of overall sales. So wow. uh, you know, when you think of that amount of growth, uh, and then looking at the business breakdown from the that's, top that's level, that's just one marketplace. That's just Amazon. Uh, no, that that was all of them combined. Oh, okay, so okay. all all marketplaces made up about forty percent of the uh, GMV portfolio. That's, so it was, a lot nice. of it was attributed to those marketplaces, and um, a, and you know the the change in the consumer landscape that's still affecting us. Yeah. And, and why do you think that is? You know, I think I've got some theories and everybody does, but why, why are marketplaces so powerful and, and why have they seen such explosive growth recently? Um, well, I, I mean, I think e-commerce is being democratized. Um, you know, I think it's never been easier to start an e-commerce business, but it's also never been easier to start uh, or try to identify an opportunity to draw in buyers uh, and, and, bring in merchandise that appeals to that buyer's needs. Um, you know, customers are quick to browse around. They, customers like to find the next best place to buy product. They like to find a, a place where there is product available that maybe nobody else is aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, customer loyalty is waning, I think, you know, unless you're really a big, powerful brand that has some type of physical product advantage or a system where you've locked your, your customer in. Um, in addition to the, the marketplace being commoditized, I mean, uh, shopping carts are, are being commoditized as well. So it, it, you can, um, I guess, I don't want to get away from the marketplaces, but um, when we <laughs> yeah. talk about marketplaces, uh, there are, there are you, we're seeing new channels pop up in different, uh, in specific verticals. You know, for example, you're seeing like uh, a marketplace like House uh, in the home improvement yes. Yes. vertical or um, Bike Exchange, which is just a bicycle marketplace. Um, and you're, you're seeing more of these boutique you know, marketplaces. Airbnb, Airbnb is a marketplace, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. The whole marketplace model is becoming incredibly, incredibly attractive um, for not only physical product, but services as well. Yeah. Um, and that's because the technology is now here to where all you need is uh, the access to supply and demand or the idea to bring the supply and demand together. Uh, and if the timing is right, you can make it happen. Yeah, which is really interesting. Let's talk about, so, so here you were, you and your soon to be business partner working away, selling a ton <laughs> of power tools, home improvement goods. What led you guys to start Cellbrite? So what pain points were you experiencing? What were you seeing yeah. and finding that caused you to start Cellbrite? 
Well, um, for that particular company, uh, the, the pain of expanding onto the channels, listing your products, uh, following the um, rules in syntax and in mapping that each channel requires um, was difficult. You know, we had kind of a homegrown inventory management system that we used and we needed to integrate that with the inventory APIs of these various channels. Um, and at the time, even when we were doing um, $50 million, we were looking at a channel advisor. Um, and in the home improvement business, margins typically aren't as great as they can be in other businesses and other uh, verticals. So for us, the uh, the tax on on uh, percentage of sales was it kind of made it a non-starter, um, and it would have been incredibly expensive. Um, and there weren't really a, many other solutions. I mean, there were like super e uh, high-end ERPs. Uh, when I say high-end, I mean expensive, really. Um, yeah. But they weren't necessarily evolving fast enough to handle the changing needs of these channels. So um, we ended up building our own. Uh, and we realized, you know, um, that and we how weren't did, alone. How did that conversation happen? Just curious. Was that like, a, did somebody mention that idea and the other one say, well, that's that's crazy. You, we can't do that. Well, I mean, if we ended up building our own at uh, at CPO, at our old company. And, they, and we were fortunate to have a team of resources to do it. And then Brian and I realized, you know, we're not alone. There are millions of smaller merchants that have a need for for better tools as well. Um, the the technological advantage traditionally favors the wealthy, uh, and e but even in our case, our case being that company, um, you know, a small company can be doing fifty million dollars a year and not be able to afford the right tools. And the fact of the matter is, marketplaces are really hard. Um, each marketplace should be viewed as its own business division really of your company because it's going to be managed ones. differently. It's going to be, it's going to have, yeah, it's going to require a different optimization, a different onboarding strategy, maybe a different product mix, different pricing and promotional strategy. Um, inventory is hard. Inventory is probably the hardest thing in retail manage, you know, managing um, the, uh, the minutia of uh, stock counts and uh, your warehouse and, and, and whatnot. Um, a, and then when you add multiple channels onto it, it just makes it a nightmare. Uh, but but also seeing the bigger picture is hard. Uh, and as a multi-channel business, sometimes you can't pull out of the details because retail is all detail. And if you are constantly just trying to keep the engine going and you can't see the macro trends, um, uh, you're going to not be able to make the right merchandising decisions or the right investment decisions to you know take you to the next level of growth. So that's yeah. why we started a software because there were there's tons of merchants out there that needed that help. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's what we wanted to do. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I love it. You identify pain point, you identify this, this major need and this gap in, in the market and you go after it. And so, and, 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 a, and a couple more general marketplace questions, but, uh, you want to just give like a brief overview of, of how Cellbrite makes this easy? Because I do think people are going to want to know, you want to check it out and we'll, and we'll, of course, point them to you later, but but just in a quick snapshot, how does Cellbrite kind of tie it all together? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you know, our view is that we want to make it easy to manage what you sell and where you sell it. Um, so as a merchant, you have a finite pool of inventory, uh, and uh, that inventory includes all the product metadata that you need to properly merchandise your products, like your images and your descriptions and your features. Um, and our goal is to build one tool for bringing that inventory data in and then streaming it out to all of your channels. Um, we, we have built a very easy to use interface um, that's fully hands-on. So without the need for any custom integration or any expensive onboarding training or really any training at all, you can get into our software, connect all of your sales channels. You can, man, uh, you can import your inventory either from uh, your own database or from any sales channel that you connect to Cellbrite, we can actually pull all those listings in and build your inventory record for you automatically. Um, and then uh, everything will link together seamlessly. So the onboarding and setup process is like super simple. It can be done in as little as 10 minutes. Um, and, uh, and then from there, you have the flexibility to create and manage listings and pricing and, and inventory across all of your channels. Uh, whenever you want. So there's no restrictions. You don't have to format everything or list everything the same way. You have total custom customization and flexibility. Um, and, and then we've built multi-channel intelligence on top of it. 
Um, so the platform is designed for to be super simple and, yeah, for, the, for understanding how your business is doing, exactly. So yeah. the, the platform is super simple to use, super simple to get started. We have an awesome uh, success team that helps our merchants uh, learn the software if they need it, uh, as well as show them features that they may not be using. Um, and we're always talking to our customers, soliciting feedback from them to help make the product better. We're always looking at new channels as they come on the roadmap and seeing where, uh, you know, where we can get them in uh, to our timeline. Um, because our customers are typically aware of new channels before we are, you know, yeah. um, yeah. and, uh, and yeah, yeah. So that's, that's great. That's, that's it's, it's awesome. in a nutshell. Yeah. And it, it's super intuitive, easy to use. Reporting is beautiful. It's awesome. So we'll, we'll tell people how to check that out in just a little bit. So let's talk about marketplaces. And obviously we've got to start with Amazon. They're, they're the biggest and it's hard to overstate what Amazon is doing in terms of growth and market share and innovation. And, you know, I think a lot of people just kind of label Amazon as, as being all about low price, but that, that's not true. There's a lot of convenience issues. They're pushing the envelope and innovating and, you know, Prime Now with local delivery and all, all kinds of really cool stuff they're doing. But why, you know, obviously Amazon is huge and so you don't want to miss that huge opportunity, but why else should a retailer consider going multi-channel? Uh, well, um, first of all, because all their competitors are. Uh, right. So a few years ago, there was a survey done of about 500 retailers selling, I think, between three and five million dollars a year. So not tiny retailers, but not large, um, you know, good sized, uh, good sized business businesses. Uh, and 90 percent of those retailers were either already on marketplaces or planning on expanding to marketplaces within the next year. Um, and uh, the reason for that is because, first of all, customers are browsing on, on market places you know it's it's super simple to shop on Amazon as everybody knows um, it's uh, relatively easy to get products onto Amazon so uh, their product catalog continues to grow exponentially um, and uh, it's also a great opportunity just to expose your brand so if you are fortunate enough to manufacture your own product um, or private label your own product uh, you have the opportunity to use Amazon as kind of a, a, a showcase for uh, for demoing certain types of products or products that you maybe only want to make available on the Amazon channel uh, versus on your website. Um, and you can curate your product selection that way. Um, you can also, if you're a reseller of product, just use that as an additional uh, mechanism to show off your brand and say, you know, we also sell on Amazon um, and that can help you win the buy box with shoppers. Um, it also can help people, it can also help uh, strengthen your brand image uh, for the future when somebody is shopping around, you know, looking for the products that you sell. Um, so a lot yeah. of great reasons to sell on Amazon. I mean, the least of which is it's a bargain. You know, you pay a commission, a flat commission, cost of sale that you can uh, rely on is always going to be the same. So you don't have to necessarily worry about trying to comp against your cost of sales from a marketing standpoint. You always know what those commissions are going to be. Um, and uh, for the 15% commission that you pay, you know, you have a massive wealth of traffic that comes to you just completely served on a platter. So, um, you know, and that's, that's kind of, I feel like goes in line with what retailers need to understand about selling on marketplaces is that um, the bounty is there if you're ready to play the game, but you got to pay to play, right? You're going to pay a commission to, to, uh, to be on the marketplace, uh, but they're providing traffic and a, and a ready and excited customer base there for you to buy your products because their interest is in serving their customers. By all marketplaces are buyer oriented, not seller oriented. You know, and that's and what it, it should be. And, and that's the way it should be, seller. exactly. And in the end, and that benefits the seller. Absolutely. But the fact, the sooner that you realize that it, they're buyer-oriented and adjust your business to fit the policies of the channel that you want to get on, the, the easier it'll be for you, the more successful you'll be, and the more money that you're going to make. Um, yeah. So you're going to have to understand, I, we've got to play by these rules. We've got to first understand the rules and understand what's going on, and then we've got to adjust our game to, to fit that. Yep. Yeah, and then just a couple of quick things that you know are important about all marketplaces. Um, you want to keep accurate stock. You know, if you oversell on a marketplace, that's bad for business because 
the 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 marketplace isn't going to be happy. The, the customer is not going to be happy, um, and they're not going to be able to get the product that they thought that they bought. Uh, so, not having good uh, control over your inventory is that, that could be potentially be hard to recover from, right? I mean, you have a couple of missteps in the beginning, and you, you never recover from bad reviews and. And not only bad reviews, but you know, we hear all the time merchants that have let their their business processes slip, and then they get suspended permanently. They lose their selling privileges on a channel, and that can be a death knell for some businesses that are perhaps too dependent on a particular channel. Right. right. Um, another thing is shipping orders quickly. You know, when a customer buys from you, uh, they're the last thing that they're expecting is for there be a, to be a delay before the product leaves their warehouse. Right, the, the the buyer is looking at what's my delivery time. Okay, it's going to ship to me in this many days. They're not really thinking about handling time, unless you specifically mention in your listing these products are made to order or require extensive handling time. So shipping orders quickly is actually a key evaluation metric that a lot of the marketplaces will judge you on. So um, if you're not prepared to do that, you might want to rethink expanding to marketplaces. And it makes uh, sense because users now are used to the the Amazon Prime model or something similar where. If I order a product, I, I kind of want it in a few days or a week. You know, I, I don't. Yep. I don't want to wait weeks and weeks. Um, it's going to kill the experience. Yep. Yeah. And then, and lastly, just to reiterate, you know, put your put the customer first on the marketplace um, and take responsibility for any issues. You know, even if it's something trivial that really wasn't your fault, if you absorb the cost of um, you know an item that was lost in shipping or uh, an issue, maybe a very very small surface issue of with the product um, and absorb that cost, it's going to ultimately pay for itself in the end. Because again, you're paying to play. It's part of the cost of doing business. Um, not all uh, shoppers are, are the easiest to deal with necessarily, but that's the same in, in all retail businesses. So. It's the way it is in brick and mortar. It's the way yep. it is anywhere. Yeah. So you, you want that good review. You want to keep the, the marketplace happy. And yep. keep things running. That totally makes sense. Let's talk. Yeah. Let's talk about this. I'm sorry. Did you have one more point on that? No, no, no. I was going to say, you know, you asked about Amazon, so I was going to try to give some some ideas on how to, you know, better capitalize on on various marketplaces. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, on Amazon again, you kind of have two different types of retailing. You have uh, reselling, where you're buying product that maybe other retailers have access to, and you're and you're reselling it. And then you have um, selling as a as an original manufacturer um, or private labeling, even where it's your own brand, um, and that product isn't available under that brand uh, from anyone else. Um, you know, if you're selling on Amazon as a reseller, it's important to uh, utilize the real estate that Amazon gives you. So Amazon actually has some probably the least amount of custom real estate uh, for the marketplaces. They're pretty buttoned up in how they. Uh, how they allow sellers to describe the products, but you do have a description field. You do have feature fields where you can, um, you know, uh, talk a little bit about your product and, and add keywords. Um, use those fields because they're actually incredibly important. They give legitimacy to your listing alongside other merchants' listings, um, and uh, and that can be the difference in you know earning uh, earning a sale uh, when you don't have the buy box. Um, it Another helps thing. with helps with conversions. Also helps with discoverability, right? It helps yep. with with getting your products to rank in in Amazon search. Yeah, particularly if you are one merchant that that does use all of those fields and nobody else on the listing, if it's a lesser known product, is using them properly, you might be how that product gets found, um, which you know ultimately helps you. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that Amazon's data is not perfect. In fact, it's a uh, kind of a disaster, but. You could argue that any retail business or service provider's data can be a disaster at times. True, true. Um, but uh, so on, on that point, you know there are oftentimes multiple ASINs that exist on Amazon for the same product, and an ASIN is Amazon's uh, identification number for an item. So if that's the case, that means that consumers are are potentially buying the same item under multiple different listings and not really being aware of it. Or Amazon hasn't consolidated them yet, which they try to do from time to time. Um, so if you can identify the, all those ASINs for the products that you sell and link them all together, um, and uh, or rather list your item on all those ASINs, then you'll be exposed anywhere somebody can buy that product on Amazon, which is important because uh, if the data is kind of messy, you know you have the right to try to take advantage of that and to uh, to until it's consolidated, and you can also request those ASINs be consolidated. Um, but that's that's where I'm having that a just a little a little bit deeper. Why, why is it important <laughs> that those ASINs are are, are um, consolidated? How does that help the the seller? 
Well, it helps the buyer, really. I mean, helps the helping it helps the buyer because when you're buying an item and you are seeing one listing for it uh, that only has two sellers listed, but there's actually another listing that has 10 and maybe includes some of the other better sellers, um, the buyer doesn't have the option to buy from one of those you know, higher ranked sellers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and it's important to have a good inventory management system that can help you manage that because you can understand that if I were to have just one listing uh, managed and I sell out there and I have these other ones floating around on Amazon, uh, I could potentially take orders for products that I don't have, which can be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> other specific insider tips, because I know, I mean, you, you're, you're in these things all the time. Other other tips for Amazon or for other marketplaces? Yeah, um, well, uh, if you are not uh, using FBA, uh, it's always uh, advisable when if you're testing Amazon to send some product to Amazon to ship FBA so that you can secure the prime advantage. Um, if you are private labeling uh, product, you know, uh, one of the most important things to do prior to choosing which product you want to invest in is doing research on Amazon to identify which category uh, is is potentially ripe for having new products uh, into it. Um, you know, you can you can learn a lot by doing by spending a couple hours uh, just digging into a category. But uh, but let's talk about some other marketplaces. So you know, eBay is still globally one of the largest shopping destinations in the world. Uh, in fact, it's like the third largest shopping destination in the world behind Alibaba and, and Taobao. Um, and actually one of the Indian, I think, Snapcart. Yeah, and it's interesting, um, eBay, eBay's kind of lost maybe a little bit of their luster, you know, because Amazon is so hot and popular and everybody's right. talking about them. And eBay's had a couple of missteps, like with their <clears throat> app, people generally not liking yeah. the mobile app for eBay. And there was the, the Google penalty issue that they had, the, the organic issue. So the, lost a little bit of their luster, but man, there's still a ton of commerce that takes place on, on eBay. You yep. can't forget about them. Yeah, so if you're on eBay, um, you know, uh, it's important to optimize your listing titles. So eBay gives you a lot more flexibility. Include your SKUs, include keywords, include your brand or the brand of the product. That's all really important for discoverability. Um, using custom templates, custom HTML templates is uh, is a really big part of improving conversions on eBay. It shows that you are a legitimate seller that in, that invests in their business and it, it makes the listings look a lot more professional. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that if you often revise your listings, if you keep your listings consistently changing, they will rank better in search. So um, you know, eBay's algorithm is uh, constantly changing, but um, they're looking for merchants that are actively involved in managing their listings. Um, and uh, one thing that's also that's a little bit more known, but is incredibly important, is to 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 try to keep your listings alive as long as possible because older listings have more weight uh, and are considered to be more valuable listings in their in, in eBay's algorithm as well. So that may mean using eBay's out of stock control feature, which allows you to keep your listings alive but hide them so that a customer can't can't buy anything from you until you receive more stock in. Um, you know that may cost you a couple of months of listing fees, but be well worth it in terms of the sales that you get once you get your product back in stock. So if you are in the position to ever reorder product, um, you know it would be uh, it would be a wise thing to consider. Uh, as so a there's a chance loss. you're going to sell it again, pay the listing fee to keep that yeah. to keep that to history keep that listing active. That listing. Got exactly. it. Exactly. Great advice. Um, yeah. Uh, on Etsy, you know, Etsy uh, offers a, a, a lot of ability to use product tags. I would identify your competition uh, on Etsy and see how the the best selling products um, are represented and use those same product tags. You know, you want to be associated with the best. Um, Etsy gives you a lot more flexibility with imagery. So take lots of high quality images. I mean, that's kind of a no brainer. Uh, it's kind of goes the same for if you are selling on Amazon, if you're selling your own product on Amazon and you can add images and create a new ASIN, lots of high quality images, you know, white background, that's, that's ideal. Um, and, and Etsy is really expanding, right? Because they used to be just handmade goods, correct? They, and we're, we're very yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's a it's a great time to actually reach out to Etsy and see if you can get on the marketplace. If you don't think that it's uh, the right marketplace for you, I would actually reach out to them and see if there's an opportunity for your products because they are growing and they are bringing on more categories. Um, and uh, you know, ultimately, that's that's their MO is to continue to get bigger and to continue to appeal to more shoppers. So it never hurts to just reach out to them and say, is there a fit for the type of products that I have? And there might be an angle there. Awesome. Um, 
Yeah. You got time for maybe one or two more little insider tips if, if you um, got. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess just quickly, I was going to say there are uh, some other popular marketplaces. Rakuten uh, is one that is actually really big abroad. Um, Rakuten bought buy.com uh, and is now Rakuten Shopping. Sears uh, is, has long had a marketplace on their site, and Newegg has long been an, a popular electronics dealer um, online. Um, Electronics. It seems like Sears is kind of gaining some traction. I mean, who, who would have thought? You know, Sears yeah, well, they're betting the farm on, on Marketplace. So they are uh, closing down brick and mortar stores and investing heavily in the digital experience, which is right, which is smart. Um, and they have, uh, they do have a physical advantage in that you can pick up product, uh, you know, at a nearby location and they can distribute and ship for a little bit more affordably. Um, potentially, they have their own fulfillment program as well, um, which uh, I encourage merchants to, to, sh to look into, fulfilled by Sears. Um, but there is a lot of opportunity in not only home improvement on Sears, but in other categories um, that are related to related to the home or uh, even in apparel. They've been investing heavily in apparel merchants. Um, but with any, with any of those, Rakuten, Sears, Newegg, I would just encourage merchants to test products, test different categories. Um, if something doesn't work, don't necessarily throw in the towel. Try other products, um, you know, try uh, different price points. The important thing to remember is that you know the the rising tide lifts all boats, and and as our our uh, industry is growing, all of these marketplaces are seeing increased sales. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Well, let's kind of wrap up with with a little bit of kind of general getting started advice. And I know when you and I were talking earlier in the week, you had some fantastic uh, sage advice on on how to get started because I think. Uh, what some merchants may tend to do is that you know they hear the growth stories of other companies and they and they look at companies like CPO and you grew from uh, you know from twenty five to eighty million and, and so much of that growth was fueled by marketplaces so they look at it and they get wide eyed and they say let's get on every marketplace let's just yeah. go for it all over you know every every single one what advice would you give to somebody so maybe they're new to marketplaces how should they start how should they go about doing this to get the most from it. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's three main pieces of advice that I'd say. First off, uh, before you do anything, research where it is that you want to go and why. Uh, one channel. Pick one channel, research it, um, determine if, uh, you know, not necessarily because it's the biggest, but what would be the best fit for you uh, and maybe the easiest to manage. So understand what the requirements are to list on that channel, understand uh, what, what category restrictions there are um, so that you, you don't do a lot of work and then get disappointed down the road. Um, second is go slow. Expanding your business should never be done quickly or um, uh, haphazardly. You want to take your time. You want to, uh, after you identify the right channel, you want to start small. You want to start with a handful of products, um, feel out all the kinks in the process, understand where the pain points are in your workflow, determine if there is additional resources that you need to bring in. Um, you're never going to go from zero to 100 miles an hour and, and be successful. You're just going to get frustrated and, and uh, you know, whoever is trying to help you is going to get frustrated as well. Um, so go, st go slow, pick a handful of products, pick a couple of categories. And as you get more comfortable, then ramp up. And then and, and lastly, once you've gotten a little bit of traction on a sales channel, it doesn't mean that that's the time to pick your next sales channel. It means that you need to continue to make further optimizations. You need to do more onboarding of product onto that sales channel. You need to reach out and build your relationship with the sales channel, understand if there are additional opportunities available to you, maybe outside of, the, of uh, you know just fulfilling and, and, uh, and listing products, but maybe like advertising or maybe um, any type of partnership that you can, that you can think of. Um, so get familiar with the sales channel, reach out to them, optimize your listings, add keywords, add better imagery. Uh, you know, you can always do better than you're doing today. So it's important to remember that before you just try to look for the next, uh, you know, spigot to turn on. Um, so yeah, research yeah. it, then start small and optimize and then, and then rinse, lather, repeat. <laughs> right on. I, I love it. I love it, Mike. This is fantastic. And, and what I'd like to do sometime, we have to have you back on the show and maybe dig in a little deeper to some more of the marketplaces. Yeah. I think there are probably some FAQs and some things that people don't understand about marketplaces that we could dive in a little bit deeper. But uh, you, your wealth of knowledge, people can check out more on your site. I'm sure people are wondering, you know, how can I learn more about Cellbrite or, or check out a demo? But how can folks connect with you? 
Yeah, um, well, you can find us at sellbright.com. Um, I would encourage anybody that is uh, that likes to read great insights on e-commerce to check out our blog. Um, we have uh, authors from around the world who have tons of e-commerce experience who contribute to our blog um, and talk about everything from uh, the software side of things to uh, actual strategies for negotiating with your suppliers to pricing strategies to, to channel specific info. Um, so, you know, a lot of great knowledge there. Um, but you can find our contact, informa on, contact information on sellbright.com. You can start a trial there uh, and reach out to us for more if you'd like to see a demo. Yeah, awesome. And, and, and getting, getting started is super easy. You guys make the onboarding process as smooth as it possibly can be. But do check out the blog. I mean, if, if you're in the stage, if you're a merchant that's not on any marketplaces and you're saying, I need to consider, you know, where should I start? And I love, I love your advice of picking one. Determining which one fits your business, fits your categories that you, can, you feel like you can manage the best. Start there. Read up on that. Ch check it out at sellbright.com and look at look at the blog and look at some info there. And then take it slow. Love that advice. Um, and then, Mike, how can folks connect with you? Are you, are you on Twitter uh, yeah. other places online? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter, Michael Eugenio. Uh, I'm not super, super active, uh, but uh, uh, would love to converse with you there. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Well, this has been super informative, Mike. Thanks for joining us. This has been a My pleasure. pleasure. Thank we'll you, guys. To, to do it again. Yeah, you bet. And so, as always, let us know. What would you like to hear more of, less of? Uh, give us some feedback, please. Uh, connect with Mike. And then, until next time, stay classy. Thank you, guys.